floor if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everybody. So yes, my name is Flora. I'm a certified genetic counselor, and I currently work with Myriad Genetics, and I'm on the board of Teal um, for the past eight or nine years. I'm also a stockholder of Myriad Genetics. I wanted to share a little bit more about my background. Um, so I actually started my career after undergraduate school as an embryologist with a fertility clinic in New York City. And that's where I really um, got exposure to patients who were undergoing cancer and wanted to preserve their fertility. Some of those patients had mutations that increased their risk. And that really piqued my interest with genetics. After which I went on to graduate school at Mount Sinai in New York City. And then I was a cancer and pediatric genetic counselor in Brooklyn, New York, where I got to know Pamela, the co-founder of Teal. And we started partnering together to build Teal and the genetics awareness resources. And then in 2014, I joined Myriad to help many providers throughout uh, the Northeast uh, prevent cancer by identifying genetic components. So it's truly a collaboration and that's where I'm at now. Excellent. So let's start the conversation talking about women's health in general, because as the question we asked earlier, is women's screening um, include cancer screening or other screenings? And there are in fact many other screenings that lead to um, better health. So one of those is blood pressure monitoring, which is should be routinely done starting at a young age in a doctor's office with routine checkups. There is female specific screenings, for gynecological health and breast health, that should be part of routine screening, including pap smears and HPV testing, as well as breast self exams and clinical breast exams as well. And the HPV screening timelines always vary. So check with your gynecologist, but they are about every three to five years, depending on past history. And they are um, undertaken with for certain um, age ranges. So those are not screenings that that typically take place forever. They take place between the ages of 25 to 65 and the HPV screening should be done um, every five years. Now with self breast exams, the ages to start those vary as well. It's good to get familiar with your breasts at a young age, but women who have a higher risk will need more, more often to have those breast self exams. Also cholesterol screening is very important. And cholesterol screening is something that should start at about age 45. But if you know you have coronary heart disease in the family, you might want to start as early as 20. And we do know that quote unquote bad cholesterol tends to rise in women after they reach menopause. So the older you are, the more, um, the more important it is for you to get cholesterol screenings. Now, Another thing that you should consider is getting uh, dental and eye exams every two years. I mean, dental exams more frequently, of course. And then also mental health screening is something that's becoming more um, recommended by various societies. And anxiety screening specifically um, should be considered for women when you go to the doctor and especially um, postpartum. So let's talk about cancer risks now. We know that there's two types of cancer that are very common. So breast cancer and colon cancer are common. Breast cancer is seen in about one in eight women in the general population. So that's about a 13% chance of developing breast cancer in one's lifetime. And as for colon cancer, we know that the risk for women to develop colon cancer is about one in 25. That risk is slightly higher for men, but it is very substantial for women as well. Cervical cancer risk is high, um, but not as high as breast cancer risks. We know that HPV infections increases the risk for cervical cancer. And the mitral cancer risk is about 3% in the general female population, which is uh, important to screen for as well, especially as women age. And lung cancer is also common. About one in 17 women will develop lung cancer, and that risk is certainly higher for smokers. So in terms of cancer screening, Women should have a mammogram every year or every other year. And the age to start those is really varies depending on societal guide, which societal guideline you're looking at. Typically, we wouldn't start before age 40 if you have no breast cancer history, but some societal guidelines might recommend starting as late as 45 to 50 annually with mammograms. For colon cancer screening, it's recommended to start screening at age 45. That age used to be 50, it's changed to 45 because we are seeing more and more early onset colon cancer. 
for cervical cancer screening, we're talking about ages 25 to start those and HPV testing should be done every five years and pap screening every three years. For endometrial cancer, there's no standard screening, but women um, should be told about, um, should consider routine screening after menopause, especially and report any irregular bleeding to their provider. So oftentimes uh, women might, um, especially if they're perimenopausal, you know, it's, it's possible when you're menopausal to have some irregular bleeding. So it's really important to differentiate a menopausal bleeding with just irregular bleeding when you're just done with menopause already. In terms of lung cancer screening, it's recommended to start after age 50, but if you've smoked, of course, that could be different. And then with ovarian cancer, and this is something we talk about a lot at Teal, there is no good screening test for ovarian cancer. So there are CA125 blood tests and pelvic ultrasounds that could be considered depending on family history and other parameters. But again, it's not really um, set into guidelines. So it should be a very important discussion um, about risk factors for, for ovarian cancer, which is something we're gonna go over on the next slide. Um, it's important for everybody to know what the symptoms and um, symptoms and presentation of ovarian cancer is. So let's look at that next slide. So if you have any of these symptoms that persist for two or more weeks, you should see a doctor. You should absolutely not think that it's nothing, it's gonna go away. You should definitely talk to somebody if you have any of these symptoms, any vague or persistent unexplained gastrointestinal problems like gas, nausea, and digestion. Uh, it could be confusing, but those could be a sign of ovarian cancer. If you have any bloating, pelvic abdominal pain, feeling of fullness that's unexplained by your diet, if you have frequency or urge to urinate, if you have unexplained changes in bowel habits, unusual fatigue, shortness of breath, and new and unexplained postmenopausal bleeding, those are all symptoms of ovarian cancer and should definitely go, um, you should go to your doctor and, and really get yourself examined if you have any of these symptoms. In terms of environmental and personal risk factors for um, some of these common cancers that we talked about, in general, you should consider the following, obesity, smoking, alcohol consumption, and radiation exposure as the biggest risk factors for many types of cancer. For breast cancer specifically, not having any children, not breastfeeding, and having some postmenopausal estrogen therapy do increase the risks of bre for breast cancer slightly. Some people ask, do breast implants cause breast cancer? They're not really linked to breast cancer, but they are linked to a type of, a rare type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that's something to consider as if you have breast implants or are you know, talking to your doctor about screening for breast cancer with breast implants in place. In terms of colon cancer risk, your diet is a big risk factor as is obesity. So people who eat a lot of processed food, red meats, have less fiber in their diet, um, don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, all those could be risk factors for colon cancer. For cervical cancer, um, sexually transmitted diseases increase risk and long-term use of contraceptives, as well as your age and the quant uh, age and timing of pregnancies. So if you have many pregnancies, that might actually increase the risk for cervical cancer. For endometrial cancer, hormone imbalances and polycystic ovarian syndrome could increase endometrial cancer risk, and so can estrogen therapy after menopause and diabetes. Now, lung cancer is tricky because many lung cancers are associated with smoking and having a family history. Um, so family history and smoking history is very important for lung cancer. Now, as for family history and genetics, um, you have to remember that there are medical conditions that run in families. In fact, really any condition could run in a family. Um, you know, family histories are very varied and um, everybody, you know, um, ages and has certain things occur within their lifetime. And it's important for siblings and children and aunts and uncles to keep their family history in mind. And screening recommendations will be affected by your family history. And they combine often with environmental and genetic factors to increase susceptibility to certain cancers and other diseases. So it's very important for people to pay attention to asthma history, blood, high blood pressure history, diabetes, heart conditions, all of those similar to cancer could impact your own risks. Now, one concept that I wanna talk about a little more is what is the difference between just higher risk due to family history and higher risk due to genetics? There's actually a difference. Um, 
when you have a single gene a component, for example, like a BRCA gene, that's going to increase your risk significantly, maybe as high as 80% or 90% for that certain cancers. Whereas if you have just a family history without a genetic factor that's been identified, your risk might be significantly higher, but it may not be as high as a gene mutation risk. So you might be at like 30 to 40% increased risk based on personal family history, but not up to like an 80 or 90% risk. But remember, we took the quiz, even people with the genetic component aren't guaranteed to develop cancer. It's just a higher chance. Now, in terms of cancer, what is cancer? Uh, cancer is caused by abnormal cell growth. So it's when a certain tissue or area in the body starts growing without controls in that cellular makeup. And that those cells then spread outside of their originating tissue and destroy healthy tissues. And the only way to identify that hereditary component is through genetic testing. There are two types of inheritance patterns for, for cancer predisposition. The most common is actually dominant inheritance. So this one right here is autosomal recessive. It means both the partners, both the, the, um, both the, the, both the partners have a carrier for a genetic change or you know, mutation that might lead to a 25% chance of that disease in a child. I guess we miss dominant inheritance. Oh. Dominant inheritance is caused by just one parent having a genetic change. So either the mom or dad has a genetic finding that increases risk, and then they have a 50-50 chance of passing it on. So who should get genetic testing? The three cardinal signs to look for are multiple young and rare. So multiple means more than one on the same side of the family. Young is really an arbitrary word, right? Like what does young mean? But really anything before 50 for a woman before menopause is considered young. And then rare is some cancers are rare. So ovarian cancer is more rare. If you remember, we just said breast cancer is one in eight women, whereas ovarian cancer might be in the general population one in a hundred. So seeing ovarian cancer is rare, pancreatic cancer is rare, or a cancer type that's common in one gender, but not another, like male breast cancer is also rare. So if you have a personal family history of ovarian, fallopian, or primary peritoneal cancer, that's a huge red flag for genetic testing. If you have two or more people on the same side of your family that have had cancer, that's a red flag. If you're diagnosed before age 50, that's significant. If you're diagnosed with two different types of cancers or cancer bilaterally, that's significant. There's a question about uterine sarcoma, it depends on the age. It is a more rare type, but everything, it, it all depends. Family members with ovarian, breast, uterine, colon, pancreatic, aggressive prostate, or male breast cancer should be considered. And then also if you have a family history of a gene mutation in a first or second degree relative, that's also an indication for testing. Uh, so what does it mean to have a positive result on a genetic test? There are some things it means and some things it doesn't mean. So it does mean that you can help prevent cancer within, uh, with lifestyle changes. So if you find that risk, your lifestyle, lifestyle changes could mean changing your diet and getting healthier. It could also mean changing surveillance, right? So lifestyle is how often you go to the doctor, how often you go for um, your checkups, and then what prophylactic um, surgical options or screening options do you undertake to mitigate that risk? And Teal has many resources available to you to, to um, learn more about how you could change your lifestyle and cancer screenings. What it does not mean is developing cancer. You're not guaranteed to develop cancer if you have a genetic change and you don't necessarily have surgery and you don't necessarily pass it on to your children. So like I said, there's different inheritance patterns. So there's different, um, there's different um, kind of risks for the next generation. Sometimes it's 50-50. Sometimes it's less than that. And there's ways to have um, offspring screened or even have um, fertility services to make sure that you're not passing on the genetic finding even if you have it. This is not a slide for us to study hard about all the different genes. We know we have over 20,000 genes in the body. And this is just a kind of a collection of the more common ones that are associated with hereditary cancer syndromes. But the takeaway for you all is that there are some common hereditary cancer syndromes, primarily associated with colon cancer or breast and ovarian cancer. 
and Lynch syndrome and BRCA1 and 2 are the most common, but even if you're uh, negative for those, there are some other genes associated with those common cancer types. So, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. You know, if some people have had some routine ovarian cancer screening for just BRCA1 and 2, there might be more genes that a person might be a candidate for screening for. And we'll hear about Pamela's story later, which shares some more information on that. BRCA1 and 2, as I just said, are the most common hereditary causes of breast and ovarian cancer. And if you think about breast cancer, the general population risk is about 12%. But with BRCA1, we're talking about a between a 50 and 80% risk. And with BRCA2, between a 40 and 70% risk. So you could see that's sevenfold, up to seven to eightfold higher than the general population risk. With ovarian cancer, as I said before, it's very rare. And we see it in about 1% of the population. But now we're talking about up to 40% or up to 20% with BRCA1 or 2. And male breast cancer risk, you know, might think, you know, 1% to 2% associated with BRCA1 is not that high. But for a man whose lifetime risk is less than half a percent, that 1% to 2% is actually quite high. So there might be changes in medical management for men with BRCA mutations. Um, and the same for prostate and pancreatic cancer. There's higher risks for those as well and changes to medical management. But Lynch syndrome, similar to BRCA1 and 2, we're talking about a very higher, much higher risk for cancer risk. So for colon risk, we're talking about an up to 82% risk, possibly for women with endometrial cancer risk, that's up to 70% as compared to 3% of the general population. And there's also risk for second cancers. Some people might you know, have a cancer, think they're in the clear, and they don't get appropriate screening, or maybe they weren't identified to have that genetic component, and then they get cancer again unexpectedly, but really had they had the genetic testing in time, we would have found that risk and mitigated that risk. So now we'll turn to Pamela to share her story with genetic screening and family history. Hi everyone, I'm Pamela. I started Tell Every Amazing Lady with my sister back in 2009 when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And after this, I went through my own journey with genetic testing. My sister was diagnosed in 2007, and then we learned that the cause was Lynch syndrome. She had a Lynch syndrome diagnosis as well. So my own family was diagnosed, oh, sorry, my own family was advised um, to get genetic testing done, um, but it was really a personal choice because only some of us did, some of us didn't. And I did get tested. I did get tested and I found that I was positive for Lynch syndrome. Over the years, more and more genetic mutations have been found. So in 2018, I decided that I wanted to get retested. I wanted to see if there was another um, you know, genetic mutation that might still be in my family because all these new things were coming out. So I found that I was actually positive for something called GRIP1. And then in 2020, and during the pandemic, I decided to get a full hysterectomy, which was the standard of care um, for Lynch syndrome patients. It had been recommended to me for a while, um, and they felt I felt that I was ready for it, um, but it's really a personal choice. Because I know my own genetic condition, um, in, in general, uh, even after my surgery, I still have to continue with a lot of health screenings like colonoscopies and other non-invasive and simple screenings. It's just a lot to keep track of, but you know, I'm aware of it, I'm empowered by it, um, and hopefully we catch anything early because I'm on top of it. So um, genetic testing has been something that's really um, positive and I encourage for others. Thank you for sharing your story, Pamela. I think, I think, and we'll circle back to this concept of when should genetic testing be redone. Uh, but I think you really share so much about that kind of reasoning about you know getting an updated expanded panel and finding out more information that could impact personal risk factors so it's really important to know that genetics is always expanding always changing and it's always important to follow up with doctors about um you know genetic options genetic testing options so i want to touch briefly on insurance coverage for genetics we talked about who should get genetic testing and basically anybody who has uh, what we call red flags for hereditary cancer risk, so multiple young and rare, those are people that often do uh, get covered by their insurance based on guidelines. And those who don't often uh, meet um, underinsured kind of policies that many genetic labs do have to help patients get testing if they meet criteria through financial assistance programs. And there are sometimes clinical trials available for other patient types. And finally, genetic testing is becoming definitely cheaper across the board. So testing that used to be thousands of, many thousands of dollars is 
maybe just a couple of hundred dollars these days. But again, if you have a family history or personal history, you're more often than not covered. And an insurance pathway is definitely an appropriate pathway to get that testing. There's different ways you could get a genetic test. One of those ways is through a consultation with the genetic counselor in clinic. So what they will do in a session is take your family history and provide you a risk assessment based on guidelines um, analysis, whether to tell you whether you meet or do not meet criteria. They may discuss the benefits, limitations, and risks of genetic testing. They will offer you testing, whether it's a saliva or blood draw, and they'll talk to you about um, the various, um, you know, give you the results. They'll tell you about various resources available to you, and they might even make some recommendations about what kind of doctors you need to see with your result. Other than genetics, um, there are things you could do to lower your risk, right? So we're talking about women's health, not only cancer, genetics, health, and risk assessment. So we're talking about a healthy diet, limiting alcohol consumption, being active, um, not smoking or quitting smoking, uh, breastfeeding if you're a mother, um, taking part in cancer screening programs and avoiding too much sun exposure, and then ensuring that your children get some appropriate vaccines to lower cancer risk. I think what's important to know is that getting a genetic test result could also impact the decisions that you make that are environmental or personal. So it's important to also remember your family history and decide if you're a candidate for genetic testing. If you feel that any of these topics apply, you might wanna to talk to your doctor or you know, a nurse practitioner or any other mid-level provider you might be seeing routinely. Or if you don't, maybe make an appointment with one you find online or one that's recommended by your friends or family. Get a referral to a genetic counselor. If you're in the New York City tri-state area, there are many great genetic counselors um, that could see you. You, especially if you don't have cancer, you you could be proactive and schedule an appointment, even if it's a month out. You have that time to get to them, and then you could discuss your genetic um, with your genetic counselor your testing options, and then get tested. So we do have some uh, kits and uh, opportunities to help. Teal could help you navigate that process. So this is where I encourage you to reach out to Elena or Pamela directly through our website, and we'll kind of help navigate that for you. Do you want to add anything to that, Elena or Pamela? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things to consider with genetics. And sometimes, you know, you want to take that step to talk to a genetic counselor, you know, make an appointment. But if you don't really know, um, if you should be thinking about doing that or not and just want you know some of our resources or the information we have definitely reach out and, and we can help and then connect you um with the with what you need and your next steps for genetic counseling here are our resources just to show you but again you know this was not um for any like individual um, medical counseling, again, mostly for awareness. Um, just wanted to make that disclosure.